All right, so today we'll be reading in Acts 25, verses 1 to 27. And uh, so I'm going to call up Trish Lutter um, to come up and read that for us. And if you all would please stand for the reading of God's word. And when she's finished, you can all take a seat as well. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So said he, let the men of authority among you go down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. After he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. Paul urged in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, To Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. And as they stayed there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man left prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews laid out their case against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to give up anyone before the accused met the accusers face to face and had opportunity to make his defense concerning the charge laid against him. So when they came together here, I made no delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought. When the accusers stood up, they brought no charge in his case of such evils as I had supposed. Rather, they had certain points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who was dead, but whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate these questions, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding them. But when Paul had appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of the emperor, I ordered him to be held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, you will hear him. So on the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp, and they entered the audience hall with the military tribunes and the prominent men of the city. Then at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in, and Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and about whom the, oh sorry, and there, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death. And as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to go ahead and send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my Lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after we have examined him, I have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. I loved that last song, didn't you? <laughs> I could hardly sing it. It was so good. Uh, 
yeah, with everything going on uh, in our church family and in, in the world today, we are the people who can say it is well with our soul, right? And that's because of Jesus with us, Jesus in us, we hang on to him. So uh, for the next uh, two Sundays, this Sunday and, and next included, I'm going to be doing a two-part um, uh, continuation of where we're at in the book of Acts. Um, what we're looking at is Paul's uh, hearing before Agrippa. Um, today is kind of the preliminary uh, setup for that, the appeal to Caesar, and then, the, and then uh, naming some of the people and setting up for the hearing. And then next week we'll cover chapter 26, which is Paul's defense before Agrippa, where he lays out his testimony and things like that. So that's kind of the, the way things are going to go um, here. So um, why don't we pray uh, just to begin with, and then we'll, um, we'll start. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning as your people, thankful for your word. Lord, you've given us a precious treasure in the scripture. Uh, where would we be without your word, Father? The word is the, the, the thing that tells us who we are and who you are and what you have done to make us your people. Um, and Lord, uh, you've done us such a kindness in giving us so much in writing that we can read in our own understanding today. Lord, we know there are many people in the world who do not have your word, um, but we are among the privileged of the world, and we want to thank you for that. And I pray that we will take the advantage that we have and share your word with those who do not have it. And in our own culture today, Lord, as many are turning away from you and do not know you, um, that we would take the opportunities given us in this week to share your message with them. Give me wisdom as I speak today. I pray that you will be honored in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are jumping into the middle of a story, so if you uh, have not been here for all of it, here is kind of what's been going on. The Apostle Paul, after years of fruitful but dangerous ministry among the Gentiles in, the, uh, in, in, in Turkey and in uh, Europe, has come home to Jerusalem uh, one of the primary reasons Paul has come back to Jerusalem is to deliver a gift of money to the struggling Jerusalem church, a uh, persecuted church really, from Gentile Christians back in Asia and especially in uh, the Greek area. Okay? So Paul comes after many years. He comes during a, a, a feast time. Jews are gathering from all over the world. Paul comes and he goes to the temple as he would have done, as any observant Jew would do. Uh, in the temple, Paul runs into some Jews from Turkey, from uh, Asia Minor, where Paul had done ministry. Now, these would be Jews who had disagreed with Paul about the identity of Jesus, Jews who had actually probably tried to kill Paul out there. Paul had been tried, uh, uh, um, nearly killed once out in Turkey already. The story in Lystra, we're familiar with that. So people from that area, okay, uh, see Paul in the temple. Paul is with a young man, a young Jewish man in the temple, and these uh, uh, Jews from afar assume that Paul has brought someone Gentile into the temple because Paul had Gentiles around him at various times, and so they make an assumption, put two and two together, and they gather a riot to kill Paul. Of course, Gentiles are not allowed in the Jewish temple. There's a rule about that, right? So they go about to kill Paul. Massive riot happening here. Of course, the Romans are basically the police in Jerusalem at the time, so the Roman soldiers come spilling down into the temple. They grab Paul, save his life, really, and, and pull him up into the barracks where Paul is going to be beaten, uh, for causing a riot. Paul at this point pulls out his citizenship card and says, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, you can't beat me. Uh, so the soldiers back off. Uh, Lysias, the Roman commander, the next day brings Paul down in front of the Sanhedrin, which is the group, the, the high Jewish council that put Jesus on the cross, and says, okay, you guys figure it out, you know, uh, have a little trial here, whatever. Paul realizes there's a couple of warring factions within the Sanhedrin, Pharisees, Sadducees, differences over doctrine. Paul throws a doctrinal uh, uh, word or two in there and gets these guys fighting with each other. The thing gets so violent, the soldiers grab Paul and pull him out of there. So there's a lot of violence going on, right? It's kind of an exciting uh, read here. Um, Paul is put into custody, and during that time, Paul's little nephew, he's not named, but a nephew, a son of Paul's sister, uh, overhears some Jews, 40-plus of them, planning to assassinate Paul, a knife men waiting on the road to get Paul, and they're, they're saying, hey, bring Paul down to the uh, high priest one more time because we really want to inquire into his case. These, these guys, these assassins waiting on the street to get him. So the Romans act very quickly. They put together 200 and something, 270 soldiers, spearmen, horses, etc., and whisk Paul out in the middle of the night up to Caesarea. Uh, to save his life and to avoid uh, bloodshed. 
Um, Caesarea uh, is, is interesting just to talk about that a little bit. Jerusalem, of course, is the capital of, the, of, the, uh, of Judea and of the Israelite uh, kingdom, but of course they're under occupation by Rome, right? Caesarea is about 50 miles away up on the coast, um, up near the Tel Aviv area currently, uh, and that is where the Romans would set up their, uh, their governor. That's actually where the governor's residence was. Probably too dangerous for governors like Pontius Pilate and these other guys to live in Jerusalem. That's a bit of a hotbed, right? So they kind of rule from afar, but they'll come down to Jerusalem once in a while. So Paul is whisked away up to Caesarea where the Roman governor uh, is. Now at the time, this Roman governor is this guy named Felix. Uh, uh, Felix, we met him last week. Felix, uh, Felix and Drusilla, his wife, Drusilla is a Jew. Um, so uh, Jewish wife, Gentile husband. Felix is the Roman uh, procurator for Judea. Um, last week we read about how Paul goes in there and, and tries to reason with this man about faith in Christ and, and, and morals and things like that. Felix gets very nervous, right? Felix is not a God-fearing man, by the way. Drusilla, his wife, he actually seduced her away from her current husband, her previous husband, and was living in a moral, immoral relationship with her. This is not a good guy, okay? Kind of a violent character as well. Uh, one thing that's interesting from history, and I, I know I'll stop on the history here in a sec, but it's, it's fun and it's interesting just to give context. Uh, Paul is in Caesarea, right, and under custody. During the time Paul is there, there are Jewish riots over stuff in Caesarea. And this Felix character who was trying Paul rips in there with the soldiers and kills a bunch of, bunch of Jewish people in the middle of street fighting and stuff like that. The situation gets out of hand. So Nero, the emperor of the Roman Empire, back from Rome, hears about this and says, Felix, you're done. You can't handle the situation. Kicks him out, brings in the next guy, Festus, which is where we ended up our last thing. And Festus uh, has to deal with Paul. Now, Festus is a good guy. Festus is a wise leader, they said, from, from, from history. Not like Felix, not sort of a, a, a violent type. But he's got a lot of stuff in front of him to deal with. One of the, one of the things is the uh, fighting with the Jews, and they're very angry about Paul, right? So he's got to deal with this. He's got this guy left over from an angry Jewish situation. So here we go with, with Festus. Now, we're going to go uh, to uh, Acts chapter 25. I'll do a little reading here on Festus and what happened. Let me see if I hit everything I wanted to. Oh, um, before, we, before we start reading the text, just a little comment on some of the things that I said to you a minute ago here with the, with the history. The stuff I'm telling you is coming from people like uh, Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, Tacitus, Roman historians. You can go on Google and you can look up these people and, 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 and dig and find out who they are. Uh, why is that important to us who are, who are Christians who are reading our New Testament? Well, it's important, number one, because the world tells us that the New Testament and the Old Testament, by the way, is just a bunch of myth. You know, it's like Lord of the Rings or Aesop's Fables or something like that, like cool, interesting, made-up, uh, legendary stuff uh, with a good moral ending or something like that. And, and Scripture is not, is not called by God a history textbook to satisf satisfy all of our questions, but Scripture tells the truth where it touches history. You know, you can look these people up that Paul interacts with. They're real people. We can date when they lived and how old they were and what type of people they were. Like, it's an actual historical event. Paul's in Caesarea at the time when there's some momentous things going on that we can read about in history. This is not a fable of some kind. Uh, so if you need, you know, evidence to trust the claims of the Bible, New Testament especially, uh, we've got a lot of it, actually. Um, scripture is an accurate representation of what has happened in time. All right, we're going to go through the uh, first 12 verses here to begin with where Paul appeals to Caesar. So no, verse 1, now three days after Festus arrived in the province, so Festus, here's the new governor coming in, right, under Rome. Festus arrives, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. So he goes to Jerusalem. Uh, this is the, the city that he's primarily ruling over, the Jewish uh, uh, capital there. So he goes to Caesarea. First time there, right, new guy. So the chief priests and the most prominent men of the Jews brought formal charges against Paul to him, requesting him to do them a favor against Paul. They urged Festus to summon him, Paul, to Jerusalem, planning an ambush to kill him along the way. A couple points here. Uh, imagine how important the case against Paul is to these Jewish people. New governor comes to town, and the first thing they want to talk about is the Apostle Paul. 
Like they are really upset about this, you know. And you think about what Paul had been involved in before he came to Jesus, like getting special letters from the high priest to travel around Israel and then go to other countries, other places like Damascus up in where Lebanon or something and, you know, get the Christians up there and shut them down and get them out of the synagogue, take them to prison, kill them. Like the, the, the Jewish opposition to Jesus and his gospel is kind of strong, right? One of the first things they want to talk about is Paul. Paul's a menace to them. Um, so you have that. The other thing is, uh, talks about them wanting to have Paul come down to Jerusalem. So don't leave him there in Caesarea. Send him back to Jerusalem. They're planning an assassination on the way. Here we go again. Probably the same 40 guys. Now I have to laugh. This is, this is two years later, right? Paul has waited for two years. Remember how this thing began. The 40 guys make an oath before God that they will not eat anything until they've killed Paul. You know, uh, so either we've broken our oath and we're taking a sandwich now and then, or we've got some very skinny assassins hardly able to, you know, uh, stand up anymore. But anyway, here we go. Uh, these guys are, are planning to ambush along the way. You know, it was a serious thing, right? Um, verse 4, Then Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea, and he himself intended to go there shortly. So he said, Let your leaders go down here with me, and if this man has done anything wrong, they may bring charges against him. Well done, Festus. You didn't bend to the Jews. I like that. Paul gets to stay safe, and you guys can come and talk to us if you have a problem. Verse 6. After Festus had stayed not more than eight or ten days among them, down in, in uh, Jerusalem there, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he sat on the judgment seat and ordered Paul to be brought. So we're going to take care of business right away. Verse 7. When he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges that they were not able to prove. Okay, this sounds like the trial of Jesus a little bit. Uh, you know, when the Jew Jews are trying to destroy Jesus, they're anything, anything we can say, like we're just making up stuff now, you know, try to get him in trouble. They're bringing all these serious charges, none of which are true, right? Paul is a righteous man. He hasn't committed a crime, but we're just saying whatever we can to get him in trouble. Remember the last time, in last chapter, where we had Felix the governor there, they brought in this skilled, like an attorney or something, this Tertullus guy, you know, who's a skilled uh, rhetorician. He gets in there and he's trying to butter up the uh, procurator and make him bend, you know, of course it didn't work. But, but yeah, they're doing anything they can, right, to get Paul in trouble, stuff they could not prove. Now verse 8, Paul says in his defense, I have committed no offense against the Jewish law, true, or against the temple, true, or against Caesar, also true. But Festus, wanting to do the Jews a favor, asked Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem to be tried before me there on these charges? Okay, Festus is in a little bit of a bind, right? Festus has, has inherited a bad situation from his predecessor, and, and he's got to deal with it, and the Jews are really angry. And this guy has just come into power, and he wants to, to get along with the people he's ruling. So what are we going to do? Throw him an olive branch, I guess. You, you want to you know, you do this in Jerusalem? Like, I'll come down, maybe we'll have the trial back there. You can see in Paul's mind things are sliding sideways a little bit here, right? They rescued me from Jerusalem a couple of years ago. They nearly got me there a couple times, you know. Now this, this governor's starting to bend, and maybe we'll take it back to Jerusalem. Paul knows what's going on. You know, we may end up getting, getting in some real trouble there. So uh, he says, are you willing, Paul, to go to Jerusalem and be tried there? Verse 10, Paul replied, I am standing before Caesar's judgment seat. Okay. Uh, the judgment seat, uh, uh, the, the courtroom of the Roman courts all over the world at that time was known as Caesar's judgment seat. It is the imperial Roman court, right? Paul says, I stand in an official court under Caesar the emperor uh, where I should be tried. I should be tried right here in front of Caesar's people. Um, and I've done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you also know very well. If then I am in the wrong and have done not anything that deserves death, I'm not trying to escape dying. But if not one of their charges against me is true, no one can hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Then after conferring with, with his counsel, Festus replied, you've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Let's talk about the appeal to Caesar just for a little bit. Uh, Paul has been in custody for two years. Okay, Paul's been waiting a long time. Now, as Jason mentioned last week, Paul has not wasted his time. There's letters that Paul has written to churches. Paul has used his time well actually to spread the gospel from a prison cell. Uh, from custody, house arrest, whatever it is there in Caesarea, right? He hadn't wasted his time. However, Paul really wants to go to Rome. Uh, Paul, before he went to Jerusalem with the gift of money and got caught by the Jews there, wrote the letter to the Roman church, church in Rome. He'd never been there before. He wrote them a letter and he says, hey, next stop after I take the money to Jerusalem, I'm coming to see you guys and help you in ministry in Rome, right? So Paul's plan is to head west to get to the capital of the empire and do gospel work there. Um, 
Paul had plans to go there. And then more recently here in Acts 23, Jesus had, had appeared in a vision to Paul at night, Acts 23, 11, and said, Paul, don't be afraid. Just like you've witnessed for me here in Jerusalem, you're going to stand before the emperor in Rome and do the same thing. So Paul knows he's going to end up some way in Jerusalem, of course, or in Rome. But of course, we just Paul didn't know how he was going to end up in Rome, right? I think Paul probably hopes that he will be released, that the trial will be thrown out and he can go as a free man and do, and do ministry again. Uh, Paul didn't know what was coming, of course. Uh, so two years, Paul's probably getting a little tired of waiting. Uh, Paul was a traveler and a man who was busy, right? So sitting there in Caesarea is probably not a lot of fun. Um, so Festus starts to bend, wants to move it back to Jerusalem. Paul, I think, probably a little frustrated, says, hey, listen, we should be doing the trial here. You know that. I appeal to Caesar. Okay, what's this appealing to Caesar thing? Uh, Roman citizens at the time had the right to do this. If their trial was taking too long or if they disagreed with the verdict or, the, or things like that, there was a right of a Roman citizen to appeal to the Supreme Court, to actually stand before the emperor himself okay, and, and do that. So Paul knows his rights. Paul's a Roman citizen, a Jewish Roman citizen. And Paul says, yeah, I want to take this up the chain to Caesar. Now, in Paul's mind, Paul is probably seeing not only a way to get his trial solved, but also to take the gospel to Rome and to talk to the emperor about the gospel. Paul, Paul has got a gospel-centered mind, you guys. You know, it's not just, let me out of here. It's like, hey, what can we do for Christ? Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, Jesus had told his apostles that they would stand before rulers and kings for his sake, is Mark 13. Uh, and so Paul is aware of that, probably taking advantage of that. Um, I want to talk just briefly, application-wise, on Christian relations with the state, Christian relations with the government. Um, we look at the way Jesus interacted with the governing authorities during his time. Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is the one who made the governors and put them in their place. But we notice that Jesus did remain respectful when in uh, interactions with the law. Okay. Jesus humbled himself to the point of even being executed by those who were in authority uh, in order to create salvation for the world, right? That's what Jesus did. And Paul and the other apostles followed suit. Um, Paul is a strong man. Paul, I think, has a bit of a mouth on him. You read some of his letters. The man can, the man can definitely throw a good argument, right? And you think, man, Paul, if anybody, would probably be the guy who'd be doing some fighting back against the governing authorities who are doing illegal things and stuff. And Paul will state, this is wrong, we should be doing the right thing here, but we don't see men like Paul and Peter and the others being revolutionaries and mounting revolt against the government. That's interesting. Paul himself writes in Romans 13 that the governing authorities that are in place have been put there by God. Those who resist the governing authorities resist what God has put in place and will receive judgment for that. You know, so Paul and the other apostles, they remain respectful to the governing authorities. They, they work with the situation they've got looking for opportunities for the gospel. That's what you see Paul doing here. Paul is in a bad situation with the governing authorities. Paul realizes his rights, so he uses his rights when he can, but the idea is, what can I do for Christ? What can I do for the gospel here? Hey, I can do this appeal thing and I can take it to Rome. We can share the gospel in Rome with the Caesar. Let's go. That's what Paul's attitude is, all the while remaining respectful to, uh, to the governing authorities. There's one thing. Uh, another little application point that I'm getting at this point is think about Paul's willingness to share the gospel with whoever he could get in front of. Guys, being real honest with you, I have a problem opening my mouth with my neighbor. You're going to find that hard to believe because I'm up here talking to you all in front of a mic, but you're a sympathetic audience, people. You know, you like Jesus and stuff, right? It's really hard for me out on the street to turn the conversation from cars to Jesus. Why is that hard? I don't know. I find it difficult, right? Look at Paul. Paul's like, can I get in front of the emperor and talk to him? I'll tell him the gospel too. Like that, that hits me in my heart. It's like, man, this man is willing to tell anyone, everyone. He's not ashamed of this thing, you know? Um, there's a good application point for us, actually. The gospel that we have been given from Jesus, which has saved our lives and made us God's people, is worth talking about. And our society around us isn't talking about it, so we've got to start the conversation, I guess, right? They're not going to bring it up. So we need to find ways to do that. Paul's finding ways to do it. I need to take an example from that, you guys, and, and I think we all can uh, find ways in our culture, in our context, to make opportunities for the gospel. Uh, the, the emperor at this time, by the way, is somebody called Nero. 
How many ever of you ever heard hear anything about Nero? Good guy or bad guy? Yeah, bad guy, right? Real bad guy, actually. Uh, Nero is the one who, at the end of his reign uh, over the Roman Empire, uh, went insane, blamed the Christians for a fire in Rome, and, and, and tortured and killed lots of Christians in very, very horrible ways. Really, really evil guy. You read about it in history. I won't talk about it here. Uh, at this point, Nero is fairly new. He's only been in power four or five years, and he hasn't flipped yet. He hasn't gone insane yet. He's got some decent advisors. He's a bit of an unknown, you know. But this man is the most powerful man probably in the world at that time. He lives in the biggest city in the world, Rome, which remained the biggest city for centuries. And this man would be like probably going to talk to the President of the United States, really. Rome at the time, you know, little Italy, had taken over all of Europe and all of North Africa. The Mediterranean Sea in between uh, uh, Europe and Africa, you know what the Romans called it? They called it our sea because they own all the land around. It's like our puddles. We put our ships on here and play in there. That's our, that's our water right there. Okay, the, the Roman Empire is huge, and this man, Nero, runs the entire thing. He's the big daddy for the whole place, right? So Paul wants to go stand in front of him. Paul is not afraid to tell the gospel to even Nero. Pretty great. I love it. Good application for us. All right, let's go to verse 13. I'm going to take a drink. <laughs> After several days had passed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Okay, we have to talk about Agrippa and Bernice just really briefly. Who are these people? Um, Festus is the Roman procurator over Judea, the area where Jerusalem is. But he is sharing rule with another guy, this Agrippa, over the rest of, of, of ancient Israel. Uh, Agrippa runs Galilee and some of the other areas to the north and stuff. He's very involved with the Jews. Agrippa is one of the Herods. You guys heard, hear the name Herod in the New Testament? Do you remember the Herod who killed all the babies when Jesus was born? Herod the Great, that guy was called. Okay, He had a son who died in the book of Acts, Herod number 2 was the one who killed James with the sword and, and, and put Peter in prison wanted to kill him too. Remember, and the angel comes and opens the door and Peter walks out on the street free. And then within the chapter, the man's making a great speech and people are praising him as a god. Oh, you're so good. You sound like a god. And then God strikes him dead. That's Herod number two. This is Herod number three. Herod Agrippa three. This is the son of the guy who was killed by the angel for taking uh, uh, pride for himself. Okay, this man is about 30 years uh, old at the time, 32, something like that. Young guy. Um, and he is sharing rule with Festus over the Jewish kingdom, okay? So Festus comes into power, Agrippa comes to greet him. Hey, welcome to your new post, sir. You know, let's get along with each other, whatever. And then there's Bernice. Who's Bernice? A lot of people just reading the thing on the surface assume that Agrippa and Bernice are a married couple. They are not. Bernice is the sister, okay? Bernice is the younger sister, about 31 years of age, uh, has had two husbands who have passed already at this time. She's got a couple of kids, and she is living with her brother in Jerusalem. That's, that's who she is. Uh, interesting note on Bernice. Bernice eventually became the mistress of Titus, the Roman gen gen uh, general, who destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Kind of interesting uh, history there. So real people, right, from history that we can see. So Agrippa and Bernice, brother and sister, come and greet Festus. Verse 14. While they were staying there many days, Festus explained Paul's case to the king to get his opinion. So Festus says, hey, Agrippa, what do you think about this guy? Saying, there's a man left here as a prisoner of Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews informed me about him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to hand over anyone before the accused had met his accusers face to face and had been given an opportunity to make a defense against the accusation. Hey, a note on Roman uh, uh, courts and legal stuff don't assume that because it's old that the Romans are sort of like, you know, uh, wild, lawless Viking people or something like that. The Roman Empire was very ordered, very law-oriented society like ours. In fact, many modern societies base the rules off what the Romans were like, very kind of structured. Uh, they have rules, right? We don't just give people to be killed because someone's angry at them. We, we have a trial and we have to do it right. So that's what I did, he said. So after they came back here with me, I did not postpone the case, but the next day I sat on the judgment seat and ordered the man to be brought. Look at this. When his accusers stood up, they did not charge him with any of the evil deeds I had suspected. Okay, uh, Festus is thinking they're going to accuse him with things like murder and sedition and revolt, you know, but it's not stuff like that. 
Rather, they had several points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a man named Jesus who was dead, whom Paul claimed to be alive. <laughs> okay, so religious talk somehow, you know, Festus doesn't have a clue. Jesus, somebody who's dead, and Paul is claiming he's alive. So they're arguing about that, like, what's wrong with that? You know, why are we killing him over this? Uh, because I was at a loss how I could investigate these matters, I asked if you were willing to go to Jerusalem to be tried there on these charges. But when, the, when Paul appealed to be kept in custody for the decision of his majesty, the emperor, I ordered him to be kept under guard till I could send him to Caesar. Agrippa says to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. And he said, tomorrow you will hear him. Okay, so there's the setup. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, Paul's statement about Jesus being alive. If you read the book of Acts, one of the things that you find the apostles like Peter, James, John, Paul talking about a lot is the resurrection of Jesus. And for the modern Christian reader, that could sound a little, a little interesting. And let me tell you why. When we talk about the gospel today, when we tell the gospel to someone on the street, what do we talk about? We talk about the cross, right? Jesus died to pay for your sins. You trust him. You will have eternal life. That's the gospel message. Why all the talk about the resurrection? Okay. Uh, Paul affirms that the gospel is about the cross. Jesus paid for our sins. But Paul, in his statements in 1 Corinthians 15, says the gospel is Jesus died, Jesus rose. Resurrection's important. And through the book of Acts, when these men are preaching to crowds and preaching to Jews and preaching to Gentiles, very often what they're highlighting is the resurrection. What's important about the resurrection? Super briefly, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to look at something Paul wrote earlier about the resurrection of Jesus and why it's important, and we'll, we'll wrap it up there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. I'm just going to read it a little bit here. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. This is written to uh, Greek Gentile Christians. Now, if Christ is being preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Back at the time, the idea of someone coming back in a body from the grave, that doesn't happen, right? The, 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 the people die, they go off in the spirit world, wherever the spirits go, but nobody comes back in a body. That is, that is the common belief of pretty much everybody at the time, maybe minus the Jews, right? 13. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ hasn't even been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is futile and your faith is empty. Also, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified against God that he raised Christ from the dead, when in reality he didn't if the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, even Christ has not been raised. Okay, he's saying, Paul is saying, hey, listen, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then us apostles have been telling a lie in the name of God, you know? And then you believed the wrong thing because you believed us and, you know, now, now what you believed is empty or something. Look at verse 17, though. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless. You are still in your sins. What does that mean? I thought the cross of Jesus was what took care of my sins. Why does Paul say if Jesus didn't raise, you are still in your sins? Let's talk about that because that's kind of important. Hey, Roman governments crucified, executed a lot of people, not just Jesus, right? Execution, that's on the cross. That's what they do back then. So Jesus gets a trial in front of Pontius Pilate and Jesus gets executed on a Roman cross. Let's say Jesus never came back. Let's say Jesus dies and doesn't come out of the grave. What does that say about Jesus? You know, death, according to Scripture, is the consequence for what? Sin. Because of sin came death. The reason people die and the reason death gets to keep the people is because the people are sinful. So if Jesus dies on the cross and death gets to keep Jesus, who is Jesus? Oh, Jesus is just a sinful man like Dave Field and anybody else, right? What's the miracle of the resurrection? Well, Jesus is not sinless. Jesus is, Jesus is not sinful, rather. Jesus is sinless. Jesus is the son of the living God. Jesus did nothing wrong, ever. So when Jesus gets killed and they put him in the ground, like Peter says in Acts chapter 2, death could not hold him. Death wanted to hold Jesus, but death doesn't get to hold Jesus because Jesus is sinless. And I imagine the third day, Jesus coming up from the grave and death is trying to grab him with his nails, keep him down. Jesus can't, death can't hold him. Jesus comes right back up anyway, right? God raises righteous people. 
Jesus is the righteous one. Jesus gets raised from the dead. Hey, little side note here. Were there other people that were raised, you know, from death to life uh, in the Bible? Yes, Old Testament has some. Uh, Jesus raised a bunch, Lazarus being one of them. What's the difference between the resurrection of Jesus, though, and the resurrection of maybe Lazarus? Let's talk about that for a minute. You know what the sad realization is? Is that Lazarus, poor man, had to die again. Right? Lazarus came out of the grave, but Lazarus had to... I mean, otherwise the man's still walking around somewhere. We should go find him. Right? <laughs> Lazarus is the man who died two times. You know? What happened with Lazarus is Jesus called him out of the grave. The man came out, breathed a few more breaths, ate a few more meals, lived a few more years, had to do it again. The man did not come out of the grave in an immortal body. Guys, there is only one human who has ever walked out of the grave in an immortal body and still lives in that immortal body. You will see him when he comes back. Same body with the nail holes. That's Jesus. That's a miracle that's only ever happened once. God raises to immortality his righteous people. That's who Jesus is. Uh, sidebar, all the people who are with Jesus... Yeah, that's what God's going to do for them at the end of the story as well. We get to come back in an immortal body and live on God's new world with Jesus, who is the first fruits from among the dead. That's more for another time. Okay. The resurrection of Jesus is kind of important. A Festus, who doesn't have a clue about Christian doctrine, has listened to Paul enough to sort of get the hint that there's something about resurrection that Paul's upset about and, and dealing with the Jews about. And the Jews disagree, and they say Jesus is dead, and Paul says Jesus is alive. And I look at that, and it's like, hey, there's a whole gospel right in there, you know. Jesus is alive. Jesus is God's man. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, and God said, yep, that payment will work because you are sinless. I'm raising you back to life. If Jesus didn't raise, Jesus is nobody. We're still in our sins. But since God raised Jesus, Jesus is everything. Jesus did pay for our sins. The payment worked. We're not in our sins anymore. Like the song that we sang said, as far as the east is from the west, right? You have removed my sins, and that's why we can say it's well with my soul. Um, that's what Paul is arguing with the Jews about. Jewish community at that time to this time still doesn't believe Jesus is God's Messiah. He did not rise from the dead. That's a lie. That's still propagated today. All right. Back to uh, Acts chapter 25. <clears throat> Finish this up here. Acts chapter 25. Uh, we're down now to verse 23. Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself tomorrow. He replied, you will hear him. Verse 23. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience hall along with the senior military officers and the prominent men of the city. Hey, this is pretty fantastic. Look who Paul gets to talk to. All these great people, right? The who's who's of Caesarea and Judea. When Festus gave the order, Paul was brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all you who are present here with us, you see this man about whom the entire Jewish populace petitioned me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting loudly that he ought not to live any longer. <laughs> People are upset. But I found that he had done nothing that deserved death, and when he appealed to his majesty, the emperor, I decided to send him. But I have nothing definite to write my lord about him. My lord there would be Nero, the Caesar. Nothing to write definitely about him. Therefore, I have brought you, him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after this preliminary hearing, I may have something to write, for it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without clearly indicating the charges against him. Uh, so here we go, set up for the, the big trial. Okay. Um, Next week, we'll do the trial. Uh, just a, a final word of application. Paul, in his writings, calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. The word that Paul uses is a slave. The idea is that Paul is property of Jesus Christ, bought and owned. Paul does Jesus' bidding. Paul makes his plans because Paul... Jesus has sent Paul to preach the gospel, so Paul says, hey, maybe I should go to this city, maybe I should go to that city, and you, you see him through the book of Acts trying to figure out where the best place is to go next. Paul's got his eye on Rome. Rome's the big, the big place where all the pagans are living. We want to go there and tell them too. So Paul makes his plans. But like the scripture says, a man makes his plans, but who directs his steps? The Lord, right? Did Paul plan for two years sitting in Caesarea waiting? No. Oh, what did Paul do while he was waiting in Caesarea? Cry and moan? No. The man wrote some letters that encouraged the rest of the Christian world for the next 2,000 years. You know? 
What does Paul do when he gets an opportunity to talk? Share the gospel? And uh, Paul ends up going to Rome in chains, not the way Paul would have wanted, but Paul's like, Lord, my life is yours. I'm your slave. Take me to Rome however you want. You know, as we're going to see in the end of the book of Acts, Paul ends up in Rome anyway, uh, like he had originally planned. A little bit of a different route, a little bit of a different path, more delays, shipwrecks, and things like that. But Paul serves Jesus. Hey, what circumstance do you find yourself in today? Where do you live? What's your context? What are the things that you struggle with? What are the things in your life that are not going according to plan? And you know what? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if I did, everybody's got some. Me too. Right? We plan. We want to do. We've got our designs and our directions, and this is what I would like. God's like, yeah, i got a different road for you. Can we say with Paul, I am the Lord's servant? Say with Mary, I am the Lord's servant. May it be with me according to your word, Father. You do with me what you want, you know, and I will faithfully serve you. I will take the opportunity to tell my neighbor. I will take the opportunity to share your son with whoever's in front of me. Doesn't matter who. You, you lead the road and I'll just keep my mouth open. That's, that's, we can all do that, right? We can all do that whether we uh, have a bad situation where our plans don't go the way we want or not. We can live the gospel. All right, let's go ahead and, and pray and thank the Lord. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you, Father, for the example of godly men like Paul who lived their faith. Thank you, Father, for the scripture that tells us about these things. And Lord, mostly we thank you for your Holy Spirit. You, the God of truth, who indwells our bodies as Christians and guides us into truthful living. Lord, I pray you'd guide us this week. Give us those opportunities. Help us to recognize them when they come and to take them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, why don't you stand for the benediction? I'm reading from Romans chapter 16 here. It says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. Have a good week.